Welcome everybody to the Efficiency for Access Design Challenge webinar series. Today's webinar is focused on sustainability and how contributing towards the Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. We have a special speaker today from Sustainable Development Solutions Network, SDSN, Dr. Kate Rohr, whom uh, we'll introduce in a moment. I am Jackie Garcia, Senior Project Manager for the Efficiency for Access Design Challenge, and I'm joined by my colleague, Sean, who you may know from previous webinars. He will be managing today the chat room, so if you have questions during the webinar and you prefer not to send to the whole room, feel free to send it directly to him. We are excited to have you all here, both live and through the recording. But just before we start, just some housekeeping information. This webinar is and its transcript is being recorded and it will be available online on the Efficiency for Access Design Challenge website and on the general workspace of the CrowdSolve page, as all of the other webinars that are part of this series of webinars. If you don't want to be um, recorded, please turn off your video and mute yourself. You can also change the name and display, clicking on the three dots on the top right hand side of the corner of your picture, or through the attendee list, right clicking on the more option next to your name. We will share the recording and slides with you following the, following the events on CrowdSolve. And during the presentation, please mute yourself to avoid any distractions and background noise. So it will be easier to hear um, our speaker. But feel free to turn your mic and micro back on during the Q&A section at the end of the webinar for some live questions. And feel free to use the hand raising function during this portion of the event that it can be found at the bottom of the screen. We will then call upon you. Additionally, the chat will be open to questions and comments from our audience throughout the event. And if you have any, any questions after the webinar or after you watch the recording, or you would just like to pick up the conversation back up again or share some resources you found interesting, feel free to do so uh, on the CrowdSolve post for this webinar in the comment section. Remember this year, webinars are organized around the different elements of the assessment criteria, and you will have to address this, this same topic in your own design process. So I encourage everybody to ask questions of our panelists while you have uh, her attention. Today, we are looking at one of the sustainability criteria and the linkages between your designs and the SDGs. We are especially looking at the question highlighted here found in your challenge brief. Oops, I'm sorry. <laughs> How does your design contribute to the sustainability, sustainable development goals, in particular SDG 7, affordable and clean energy? How well have you demonstrated you understood the potential connections with the other uh, SDGs and its associated targets? And consider how the different areas in this assessment framework are contributing to this. The webinar agenda for the next uh, hour or 55 uh, minutes <laughs> will include a presentation from our special speaker followed by a Q&A section. And some, uh, we will have some uh, small breakout rooms um, to discuss in smaller groups. So our speaker today, it's Dr. Kate Roll. She has an impressive curriculum and I would like her to introduce herself. Over to you, Kate. Thank you so much, Jackie, and, and thank you so much to everyone who's who's joined. Um, it would be great in the chat to add, uh, put where you're from, um, where you're joining us from today, and maybe a little bit about yourself, because we've got a small enough group that we can uh, have a little bit of interaction. So uh, my name is um, Kate Roll. I'm an assistant professor at University College London at the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, and I also lead up the Sustainable Development Solutions Network UK, which is a university-wide network um, based in the UK, but there's also regional and national networks all over the world. So it's it's quite possible that wherever you are also has an SDSN network and has a um, student 
student hub. So, you know, take a look at that. Um, I'm a political scientist by training um, and my work has been eclectic. So I've worked on everything from post-conflict transitions to private sector approaches to poverty reduction. And then a lot of my current work has been around the SDGs, including a big project that I just finished in Spain, thinking about the, the connection between the sustainable development goals and, and tax. Um, so I'll probably go ahead and, and share my screen. Um, so if you unshare, Jackie. Okay, great. Wonderful to see people coming in. Um, great. And, you know, if you have the bandwidth, it would be great if you have your, your camera on when I don't have slides up. And when I have slides up on the screen, then it's fine to turn your camera off. That's how I do it when, when I teach. Um, great. So I'll go into my slides so everyone can relax. And then we'll, we'll do a couple exercises just to get rolling. Okay. So, you know, I'm going to give a bit of an overview of, of, of the SDGs, what they are, what they're about. My experience has been that we talk about the SDGs all the time. We see them everywhere, or you see them often. You see people with their lapel pins, um, or they're in the first bit of a journal article. But very rarely do people sort of dig into them a little bit more, and particularly think about the politics of them. And so I'm a political scientist. So I'm very interested in, in, in those kind of dynamics. So I'll talk a little bit about what the SDGs are, where they came from, right? These, these have a history to them, um, what they look like in practice. And then I'm gonna talk through sort of four main questions that come up, some which should be highly relevant to your work. Um, I'm also gonna give us a, a sort of a moment to reflect on SDG seven, which is most closely tied to the work around energy that I think all of you are doing. But before we go into that, I wanna do a exercise using Mentimeter. So if you go to menti.com, and then you enter that code, I'll put both of these in the chat, then you should be able to enter some, some information about yourself. I'll collect a, a little bit of a, a social, social graph. So I'll put this, I'll stop sharing and I'll put this into the chat. I'll put, uh, I'll put also a direct link into the chat, which makes it a little bit easier. So if you go there, you should be able to answer a few questions about yourself. Great, so I'm seeing a couple people have have put theirs in, that's great. So if you use, so Nora, if you use the, um, the code, the link that I've just put in the chat, you should be able to, to, join, to do the, um, So I'm seeing one engineer and one other, and the information in the code is there. Let's see if we can get maybe two others to, to go. And maybe put in the chat what you are if you're not, not one of these, these uh, areas of study. Data science, industrial design, excellent. Okay, very nice. So when you're ready, we can go to the next slide. So we've got five participants, that's good. Um, let's go to this question. How, how familiar are you um, with the SDGs? And should, this should be a linked response. Is this something you work with a lot? Somewhat familiar?
So this is pretty normal that no one feels like they're a complete expert um, in this area. And maybe we'll just go to the last one, which is a brainstorming, um, or we'll do words that you associate with the SDGs. Um, here we use a, a um, create a word cloud. So it should ask you to, um, to enter a few words that you, you associate with, with the SDGs. Thank you, Jackie, for putting in, in the code there as well. Let's just get a couple people putting in words that they associate with the SDGs. Okay, that's fine. If, if that's we can go on with the slides. That can often be a nice, a nice exercise to see where sort of if where people, what people's thoughts are about the SDGs, what their sort of understandings are um, of the SDGs. But good to see the group, good to see where you guys are coming from and what type of experience. Um, I'm used to talking with people who are mainly political scientists or designers or public policy people. So it's always good to have a, a different perspective. Great, so, so we'll get moving with the talk. So the sustainable development goals, you know, this is the sort of image that most people are familiar with. We've got the 17 goals, then we zoom out, we've got 169 targets, so, so a lot of targets, and then even more indicators, um, over 230 uh, indicators. And these were adopted by the UN member states in 2015. It's also sometimes called the 2030 Agenda because they're supposed to be achieved by 2030. And it's aimed at forming a comprehensive and consensus view of the future. And this is, this is a slide for your reference, not one that I would expect you to be able to read here. The point in the history that's captured in this slide is that there is been a long process leading to this. So this agenda was adopted in 2015, but it really was first conceptualized in 1992 with the um, Rio Earth Summit. And you know, if you think about the work that led into the Rio Earth Summit, so these kind of goals, they have this long history. They've got this, um, you know, multiple steps that, that it took to get us here. Um, and so, you know, these didn't come from nowhere. These have a history. They've got key participants, key voices. And the precursor to the um, SDGs were the Millennium Development Goals, which some of you may be familiar with um, if you're, you're sort of my age. Um, and so those were adopted in 2000, and there were just eight of them, right, not 17. And they were considered to be simple, measurable, consensus-based, but they were quite different from the SDGs in the sense that they're focused on a North-South aid agenda. Um, they only applied to developing countries, you know, post-industrial or industrialized nations. These, these weren't for them, um, which is different, again, to the SDGs, where all uh, UN member states are, are signed up. And there's a sort of a geopolitical or political economy critique saying these were part of sort of a post-Cold War world order, of, of a rationale for aid in the, in the post-Cold War ge ge geopolitics. And despite sort of the breakthrough nature of, of the Millennium Development Goals, there was a lot of concern that these had a very basic needs view of poverty. So a view that focuses on the individual and maybe things like how many calories someone needs to eat rather than a social or systemic or embedded view. Um, there was not much interest in systems or inequality, not much interest in, in, in institutions. Um, so there was a lot missing, you know, the parsimony of eight led to, led to some missing pieces. And it was considered to be sort of a technocratic approach. So coming from very high up with the UN Secretary General and not so much consultation. And so, you know, for all the positives of the MDGs, you know, they, they were in for a lot of critiques. And so, you know, 15 years after the MDGs, we're looking at the SDGs and we're already talking or starting to have conversations about what comes after the SDGs. But the SDGs widened the scope, right? So we've got more goals. It's a more systemic view. Um, 
it, it had a much more bottom up view. So um, environment ministers from Latin America were really key actors in getting the SDG set up. So a very different origin story than coming from sort of the closed office of the secretary general. So, so a different story here um, uh, and sort of in some ways that some positive and also critically important widened to all nations. So again, this is a little bit of a timeline of the consultative process um, where it was moving um, between an open working group and then the high level political forum. So you're having many more people around, around the table. But there's still been some critics. You know, when, when this first came out, we think two sort of bastions of, of <laughs> um, public opinion, the foreign policy magazine and the economist all sort of made fun of the SDG, senseless dreaming garbled, stupid development goals. So, you know, this hasn't, you know, everyone sort of is signed up to them now, but you know, they were they were controversial at the time and, and were, were uh, more widely critiqued. So we're going to go into sort of SDGs in practice, giving that that just being sort of a little bit of the origin story of the of the SDGs. So again, here we are, 17 goals, 169 targets, 232 indicators. And if you haven't done this, I really encourage you to go to this URL, which we can put into the chat and actually just download the, the um, Excel table of the SDGs. You know, it's, it's highly accessible, it's searchable, it's really easy to use. And so anyone can just pull down the SDGs and be able to look and sort and manipulate some of that, that, that um, framework. So, you know, it's, it's out there and, and easy to get through UN stats. And that's where we start to see, so we've got um, gender equity, um, being SDG five. And then we start to see, okay, what are the targets? Well, here we've got highlighted enhanced use of enabling technologies, particularly ICTs to promote female empowerment. So you see, okay, that's the target. And then you dig a little bit deeper and they've got an associated indicator. And so they're looking at a breakdown of a portion of individuals who own mobile phones by sex, right? So you can sort of lift under the hood, lift under the bonnet and see what's going on. And this is, should be familiar to any of you guys who have done m and &E work. It's a mix of different types of, of indicators. So we've got, we are measuring inputs. So like the number of doctors um, per capita, outputs, the number of people trained, outcomes, what percentage of people have a certain disease or what percentage of people have a certain access to, to, to treatment um, and impacts. So, you know, it's a bit of a jumble in there which can also um, affect how we interact with the SDGs. And what I wanna do is because all of you, you know, have been working on, on energy issues, is to take a moment in, in breakout rooms, I'm gonna see if this works, um, to just reflect on goal seven. And we can put this, um, this into the chat. Um, I'd love if you go in your browser to the, the link there, we'll put it into the chat. And then on the second tab, it just has a list of the targets and indicators for, for SDG 7. And I want in your small groups to consider the questions. What surprises you about this? What, what's missing? You know, there's a lot of things there, but from your perspective, what, what do you think are missing in terms of the targets or indicators? And what are the strengths or weaknesses of, of how these are being conceptualized? So I'm gonna stop sharing and, and put this into the chat. Any, any questions about what I've just asked you all to do? Okay. So I'll put everyone into breakout rooms and we'll just go in for three or four minutes. Yeah, I've just put the link in. Great, welcome, welcome back everyone. So you've had sort of two quick, quick breakouts with your group and I would love to hear um, what you discussed, particularly if you came up with any observations or strengths and weaknesses looking at SDG 7 and how it's constructed. Um, is there someone who would want to represent um, one of the groups? We had two groups. Yeah, Jati. Please come in. 
so uh, in in our uh, group me and uh, jian chen we had a great discussion regarding what are the advantages and uh, disadvantages so uh, the advantages of uh, sdg 7 is uh, it's uh, it aims to have clean and affordable energy for all uh, so that's the advantages the advantages is it, it is sustainable and it aims to uh, Uh, make it affordable the affordability part is uh, great here uh, but at the same time when we is when we discuss the uh, disadvantages part so uh, what we what we discuss is for sdg 7 uh, it will be a huge economical burden for uh, countries to uh, be uh, to provide clean and affordable energy for all because currently wherever it is wherever the uh, wherever people cannot don't do not have access to electricity or energy it is due to uh, lack of infrastructure and finance uh, and to some extent political will so uh, sdg have that at disadvantage that it requires a lot of finance yeah that's a really nice point and if if you go in um you know 7.8.1 they actually try to capture some of that by saying you know what are the international financial flows to support these this energy transition but you're absolutely right that you know you can trace the the percentage of 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 folks that have access to to clean and affordable energy but you know where are you creating that shift how are you making sure that happens yeah really nice nice observation see mang do did you want to add to anything that jyoti mentioned that's right i uh, i agree with the, what uh, jyoti had said uh, it might take a lot of effort or a, a lot of finance to build the the infrastructure and uh, but once it's built or uh, we are going to find a way to get easy access of the um, the effort of the uh, the, the infrastructure um, it will achieve the goal just as the the, the seventh goal as, as i said which can be um, access which can be accessible um, both uh, on on our human beings and also for the uh, environment which means uh, maybe we can achieve this a, a second system which is less harmly uh, harmful to the environment uh, by a small uh, by a small uh, amount of financial uh, issues by the kind of this uh, issues mm, yeah yeah really nicely put yeah yeah well done mm. both of you guys And anyone else want to contribute from from the other group? Did you guys talk about the financial aspect or or other aspects of the of the SDG? Okay, if if not that's that's totally fine. I'm going to move forward. But this is just a reminder, you know, when you've got some time, go into that link, go into that second tab where it goes through the targets and indicators. and really take a close look at you know what's being tracked what's being prioritized in the SDG and in your own position as someone who's who's learning a lot about this studying this is building expertise you know what's your own critical reflection on how it's being operationalized okay good so and, and this this sort of goes to you know when we talk about the strengths and weaknesses you know we do need to think about you know these are incredibly powerful we're asking nations to report against them we're asking big corporations in some cases to 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 report against these indicators or a modified form of them um so you know we really need to be careful about that and this is a nice sort of critique by a, a scholar called um Fukuda Par who says you know goals can lead to distorting effects you start to orient your action towards the the goal not necessarily towards you know maybe maybe the bigger picture so you know we need to be very very um careful about you know how we set up um our our indicators particularly um because you know like that example with women and mobile phones if we're talking about well empowerment through technology is that the same thing as having a woman access a mobile phone i actually think there's a some slippage there between the 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 goal to the target to the indicator and I'll, and i'll talk about that in a bit um so we have these quantitative indicators um we have um you know a few different characteristics that we see across the set so i want to you know close the talk by by raising sort of four key um questions um four questions that i think everyone should should be thinking about 
um, when, when they think about the SDGs and I think are too often left out. So the first question is, are SDGs neutral? Um, the second is about how do they interact? Um, and this is, I think Zimang already mentioned this a little bit. We're talking about energy and environment. Um, and, you know, they, they comment about financing and institutions. And, you know, we're, we're already seeing points about, about interaction. How do they drive change? And then what about context? You know, does this mean the same thing in different places? Is it possible to have a single set of goals or possible to have a single set of indicators that are meaningful? Um, both, both in, in the UK and in Nigeria, right? Where I, I understand many of you guys are, are joining us from. So the first is, you know, we like to pretend the SDGs are neutral or technical, but they're the product of a political process. And, you know, there are issues that attract a lot of attention. There's ones that are considered orphaned that aren't so interesting that people don't you know, want, want to spend time on, and so those get left out. Um, there's things that are extremely hard to measure. So one thing that we see is not in the SDGs are things around language and culture. And I think part of that is these can be very, very hard to quantify. Um, there's tension between statisticians and diplomats. And then there's always questions about, you know, who has the final say. So, you know, the SDGs are both highly comprehensive, but also have some blind spots. So you can see I've pulled headlines about debates over well, whether LGBTQI or you know, gay, gay and lesbian rights should be included in the SDGs. That was a negotiated, um, contested part of them, just like um, language and culture are also a contested part that then ended up not being in. So we have to remember these are political, these are product of a political process and negotiation. Um, and their expression are, is also political in the sense that you know, firms and countries you know, say, oh, we're committing to all 17 goals. But if you actually look where energy and investment is going, energy in terms of political will, another good point um, raised, raised by participants, is that it's not evenly distributed. So you know, much more attention will, will go um, to, to um, poverty, for example, then we'll go to institution building. Um, more, more energy will, or more, more focus will go to um, gender, then, then we'll go to, to um, energy. You know, we, we've got different, we've got these the, the sort of disproportionate. So um, you can see that in this, in this um, ranking table, the green ones are where we see the most. Um, investment, uh, you know, this is looking at corporate numbers, and then the ones at the bottom, so decent work piece, um, life on land, life below water, those are all um, further down. The second point is we need to be thinking about SDGs as interacting. We need to be thinking about bundles of policies, bundles of interventions, um, and, you know, they can have both reinforcing interactions and they can have counter <laughs> countering interactions or, or negative interactions. Um, so you know this this example in this paper by Fader that I've um, you know quoted here is saying, well, you know, we can look at water and land. Um, these are incredibly important, but are these in in conflict with high yield agriculture? You know, how do we balance these or how do we figure out how to manage conflicts? Because at, at a certain point, you know, increasing energy, you know, if it's not, you know, clean energy or even if it is clean energy and we're talking about transitions where we're taking a lot of cars off the roads, you know, that that's creating um, different forms of waste that can have um, negative impacts. So we can't think of these in isolation. We've got to think of them as interaction, interacting. And so, you know, this is uh, some work done um, around clean water, zero hunger, and energy, um, and saying that, you know, if you see any of these sort of pink ones, that's where there's this view that the, the relationship is constraining, where one going up can constrain the ability of the other to go up. But also, equally, you can see that most of this table is what they call supporting or reinforcing, um, whereas they actually move in concert, you know, improving um, clean energy can be a great way to it improve um, clean air, right? You know, we're seeing fewer um, particulates, we're seeing fewer, less CO2 emissions. You know, you can, you can see those as moving together. Um, but, but this really needs to be, you know, central and in focus. And my sense is whatever comes after the SDGs, 
is going to have a lot more focus on interaction and a lot more focus on bundles and linkages rather than individual targets um, and indicators. The third point of four is this question of how do SDGs drive change? You know, this is a question that I get a lot from, from particularly undergrads where they say, this isn't the law. You know, the UN can't make law, they can't enforce this. What's the point? How does this affect anything? Right. And, and there's a part of me that says that's an absolutely, you know, that, that's, a, that's a perfectly valid critique of the SDGs. And it is one of the weaknesses. But then we also think to say, OK, well, we don't have hard international law on this. We've got what we call soft international law. How is that still impactful with limitations? And so we have to think about the audience. So who are the SDGs for? We think a lot about how they are used by advocates advocacy organizations, and then use them to, to have a dialogue with policymakers. Um, they're used by funders and aid agencies. There's been a lot of work trying to harmonize reporting requirements. They're used in corporate reporting increasingly. They're using an investment. We've seen this growth in ESG investment and the SDGs you know, are, are linked into that work. So there's, there's a few core audiences and then of course, pathways through, in, through those. And so we see elements of peer pressure that come through reporting. Um, we see civil society mobilization. Um, if you guys have done a bit of political science, you might be familiar with the idea of agenda setting. You know, what is on the list? What are we going to discuss? What is important to say we're committed to? And then those kind of commitments can help create political will and help create political change. Um, so what is considered to be appropriate? What's the norm? And then there's also sort of methodological changes where we're saying that these indicators are important. So organizations need to start shifting their practices, need to start shifting their policy design to meet and promote these indicators. So that's also quite um, important area. So, you know, again, you know, the, the SDGs have a lot of open source data behind them. Um, the UK does a report, you know, na nation, lots of nations not only do their own report, but places like Bangladesh and Vietnam have set up their own indicators, they've localized their indicators. So there's a lot of information out there. And that's a very useful um, tool for advocates. So you can see <laughs> how there can be, you know, Spain and Portugal, you could say, well, look over the border, you know, they're doing better than us. Um, we need to catch up. You can see how some of those um, discourses can be harnessed. Um, and then this, this idea of normative change, like I mentioned, you know, what is considered to be the right type of policy, the right type of speech, you know, and you're seeing this certain places and certain countries have really adopted language around the SDGs and others have avoided it. Um, but there's sort of a window of opportunity to connect policies and, and, and the sustainable development agenda. And I also, I'd mentioned in that, in that earlier slide, this sort of methodological change. What do we measure? What do we care about? Um, what, what, do, what are we looking for? And this can be critiqued and sort of, you know, this governance by numbers, again, quoting from Foucault du Par, um, but it also says that, well, we're, we're looking, you know, we're, we're looking for these certain things um, and they're helping to, again, set priorities. Um, you can also see how SDGs can start to play into policy processes. This is a really classic policy cycle where you're looking, you're starting with problem identification um, and then moving towards um, policy formation. What is the policy? You're saying why it's the right policy, you're implementing it, then you're evaluating it, um, and then you're shifting. And so you can see that you know, the SDGs can come in to a lot of different points in terms of both giving targets that we're do, using for our measurement, for our policy evaluation, but also in that policy legitimization. Why do we need to do clean energy? Why do we need to work on this green transition? Well, we've made commitments to the SDGs. The SDGs are an important global agenda, right? You can see the rhetoric that's tied to that policy legitimization, um, which, you know, again, tied to, tied to political will. Um, and this, this is a, just a minor point. You know, you can also argue that the SDGs come embedded with what we call a theory of change. So a viewpoint on what matters and how things work. So the example that I already mentioned about women and cell phones, you know, there's sort of an idea that more cell phones for women <laughs> means, means, you know, more, um, more 
you know, access to technology, and that has some gender equity benefits. And I think we can engage with those critically. That may be the case, but it may not necessarily be the case. And then finally, um, and this should, this should, I think, be, be interesting to all of you, because it looks like you're coming from lots of different places, is context is so important. So the same goals and targets and indicators that we're using in Spain, we're also using in Kenya, right? And so there's a, a question of what interests are, are intersecting and then what aren't. You know, when I was working in Spain, they're not really concerned about youth so much. They're really concerned about an aging population. Whereas other places that have a much different demographic makeup, ideas of a youth bulge, of, of a young, young people is really, really pressing. Um, so, you know, there's areas where, you know, the, the issues are just really different. You know, are you worried about malnutrition and malnourishment or are you worried about obesity, right? So we were both those fit under health, but they're, but they're sort of really different. And so there's that one size fits all becomes a real challenge. Um, so, you know, then you say, well, let's make some variation, let's sh shift, let's create our own indicators, which sounds great. You localize, right? It's called localization. But then suddenly you've got, <laughs> you know, 192 different indicator sets and some of this coherence by having one set of SDGs for everyone starts to break down. So this is one of the, again, just like the interaction is a core tension, this type of um, contextualization, localization is another core issue. This is um, an example from um, South Africa where they're working to align their national development program with the SDGs. Um, so you see, you're seeing a lot of sort of local political action that's either adjusting frameworks or, or connecting them to existing frameworks. So again, these are sort of four key beats, four key considerations that I think, you know, get left out in some discussions of the SDGs. You know, are they neutral? How do they interact? How do they drive change? What's the mechanism if we don't have that hard international law or hard law behind them? And what about context? So I'm gonna I'm gonna conclude there. Really, um, you know, the SDGs are political. They have a history. Um, they are contested and imperfect. Right? There's lots of bargaining, lots of negotiation that went into them, um, and they have ideas embedded in them about what is sort of the good way forward, right? And, and in that way can also be contested. Um, so those are sort of some, some issues that I think are always important to keep in mind, along with sort of the importance of, of this framework for aligning action and, and raising awareness and, and creating sort of political space for, for certain key changes. So I'll stop sharing there. And um, I've used more time than I expected, but I'm happy to take um, questions for, for the, um, for, for the rest of the time that we have. I understand you're incorporating SDGs into some of the projects you're doing. And I'd be also just curious to hear how you're, how you're doing that. You can write the questions on the chat or raise your hands or unmute yourselves. And, and if there's no questions, that, that's absolutely fine. I think you know my, my main recommendation to all of you guys working on the SDGs is to actually go into the, the framework. Um, very easily accessible online through UN stats. Um, easy to find data from, from your country or countries that you're interested in. And you know, rather than staying on this really generalized view of the SDGs, to open it up and, and look critically at, at the composition and see how your work um, fits with it, or actually maybe addresses parts that aren't part of the SDGs, which I think is equally important to, to understand and recognize. So you know, dig in, really, really look at the at, at not only the 17 goals, but also the the 169 targets and the 232 um, indicators. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Kat. Thank you for the nice uh, presentation. Can I ask you a question? 
Of course, please. Yeah. When when designing like when you're designing a product, you talk about uh, we when we are considering about the the political uh, issues like. Um, uh, when you are designing for, uh, especially when you are designing a product for the for the area or the uh, the country that you are not familiar with, so uh, can you give us or give uh, me uh, some kind of recommendations or methodologies when it comes into the ethnical problems when doing a design or something? Yeah. So, so challenges in designing for for contexts that you're not familiar with, is that right? Exactly. Yeah, it's a really good question, and I think the what we're increasingly seeing as best practice is that you try to avoid that situation in the sense that you want to partner with someone who really understands the, the, the context or the issue. You know, this, some of this we talk about, um, you know, pro-poor um, innovation or para-poor innovation, um, particularly if we're talking about low-income folks. And you might involve people in product design and testing who actually would be using um, using the product, um, you know, it's not always possible, um, but but that's sort of always the aspiration. And there's, you know, just many many stories of of products being designed without having the participation of people, and then not being effective in the field. Um, I, I used to teach the one laptop per child case, which was sort of an ed tech invention of a, a very robust laptop, which was supposed to be a hundred a hundred dollars per laptop. This is coming out of MIT, and they'd spend a lot of time on the product design and i think it probably was still pretty good but what they hadn't considered was the whole what we call the social envelope around technology so teachers really hated this and they hadn't gotten the teachers involved so you know the department of education they were buying all these laptops but but the teachers didn't see how they fit in the, in the classroom they resisted it and so the technology never was used as envisioned so it's both thinking about the users, thinking about the various stakeholder groups, thinking about the systems in which in which these interact. You know, there's lots of stories of of stoves being invented that aren't the right sort of, you know, shape or or heating elements for for local cuisines. So that's that's where all of this involving people who who are the end users becomes inc incredibly important. If you can't do that you know, Skype interviews, lots of research, um, find people in your network who know about the users. Um, and, and, you know, and also all these design principles of iterate, you know, learn, learn fast <laughs> and, and change as you go, I think are, are often the, the, the advice, but yeah, hope that's helpful. I see, that sounds uh, very reasonable. Yeah, it reminds me of one, one example, like, um, when you are going to fetch, uh, when you're going to fetch some fetch some water uh, during during research, like when you're going to fetch some water, the uh, the people in, in in Uganda they maybe uh, fetch the water with a barrel and put it uh, up up all the way up their head. But somewhere in China, we may be using two barrels and using a, a shoulder pole like that. Um, so uh, as you can see, it's the it's the same appliances uh, and the same using for the product. It's for fetching water, but in different areas, it might be um, uh, different useful and different uh, custom custom customizations. So yeah. um, it's always good to consider about this. But you know, uh, doing a research is a little bit hard, especially in COVID times. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And that's always going to be going to be the constraint. And, you know, we see that with academic research, along with sort of product design and, and sort of um, some of this innovation uh, initiatives. Yeah, but I think understanding it's it's both, you know, the, the technological context. So, you know, where's the water table, you know, what kind of wells are appropriate? Is there arsenic in the in the groundwater? So we need to be doing it. You know, there's all of those sort of technical specs, but there's also, again, that social envelope of, you know, what's the function, you know, who's doing the water collecting? What do they like about it? What, do, you yeah. know, why, why does the system work that way? Because I think oftentimes people just say, oh, that looks really inefficient or that looks like it's badly designed, but actually, you know, we see these practices, be, you know, becoming over many, many decades, yeah. Um, there's a reason behind them. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's a wonderful answer. Yeah, I will try to search for the the network I'm uh, I'm familiar with and uh, uh, search for the people who really knows about the area I want, which one to dig into. Yeah. Thanks Excellent. a lot. Yeah. Thank you.
Great. So, you know, we're, we've basically come come to the hour. So, you know, thank you all for for your attention and for for joining. It's been really nice to, to spend some time with you. Um, I'll be sharing the the slides um, with with Jackie, um, so she'll be able to to send those around. And Jackie and Sean, I think the recording will also be available. So I I, I hope that's useful. And please get in touch if you've got. Uh, more questions around the SDGs and um, check out SDSN, you know, the UK, if you're based in the UK, check out our network, but they're, they're all over and they've also got youth networks that are, that are globally active. Um, so that might be an interesting place, particularly if you're doing, doing work in this space and you're really working on solutions. Um, they have a nice platform for, for connecting. Yeah. Thank you, Kate. It was a really, really interesting and inspiring presentation. Um, thank you, uh, Kate, and thank you to all the attendees. I'm sure this uh, session has given you all a lot of uh, food for thought and triggered some of the some ideas on how you can incorporate uh, uh, what Kate has been sharing with you all today into your project designs and beyond that also. So thank you. I just... Great. Now for closing, uh, the recording of this webinar will be available, as I mentioned at the beginning, on the Efficiency for Access Design Challenge website in case you want to revisit some of the examples and interesting information you've listened here today. We also value your feedback and we would like to hear your opinion. So let me share my screen so you can... Um, You can go to uh, scan this um, QR code and you can go to the feedback survey. It will take uh, less than uh, one minute to respond and uh, that will help us to, uh, to improve for, for the next one. Uh, I'll share the link also in the chat in a moment. <laughs> here in case you cannot uh, yeah, access um, through the um, QR code. Okay. Um, yeah. Also, if you haven't signed up to our uh, um, challenge newsletter, you can do it uh, through this next link here and you will receive the newsletter every two months with some information about the challenge and um, some of the updates uh, uh, from the from the sector, etc. I'll share also here on the chat. And if you have any questions or comments, please send us an email to e4achallenge at esd.org.uk. The email is in the chat also. And yeah, thank you very much. Thank you to all. And see you on our next event that it's the second career conversation session that we will focus on startups and will take place on the 17th of March. Thank you very much. Have a lovely day. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.